Hello everyone, welcome to this UK data service workshop on geographical data visualisation of UK census data. Um, your presenter today will be James, James Crone of the UK data service. He's based at Adena at the University of Edinburgh. And now over to James. Thanks, Jill. The layout of the day is there's going to be um, a few presentations from me and quite a few actual hands-on practical exercises. The emphasis in the workshop is to actually get your hands on using data and software. Let's continue. So we'll start with a quick introduction to the UK census, census data and how census data can be visualized geographically. So what is the census? Well, the census is a survey of the UK population held every 10 years by the, the devolved national statistical agencies. So in England, that's Office of National Statistics. In Scotland, the National Register of Scotland and in Ireland it's NISRA. Um, in England, it was taking place in 2021, but in Scotland, because of the COVID pandemic, it's only happening this year. And in fact, in Scotland, Census Day 2022 is on this coming Sunday. So you're in Scotland, you've not actually filled your census form and yet do it by Sunday. And the population fills in a census form and answers questions relating to to them as either as an individual or the household which they reside in. And you can see on the slide the household questions and on the right the individual questions. And it's a way of the government um, getting information on the population every 10 years. So it's a great source of information. And what the census agencies do once they've gathered all this information is that they process it and create various output census data. Um, and they, they, they tend to aggregate the data. So the data comes out as counts of people or households for particular social economic characteristics. So what you, you can see in the slide here is an area of Edinburgh. Um, the census data comes from various small areas of geographies. And within those small areas, you get different um, types of data. So for example, you get the total population, number of households and the number of people within that area who are male or female, as well as information such as the tax houses or flats. And the census data itself is available at various different output geographies. So you can get data for all of the UK and then it will break down into countries, so England, Scotland, Wales, or local authorities, so um, Manchester Unity Authority, for example, um, and then wards, electoral areas, and, and these tend to nest in some cases. Within the UK data service, um, we provide a one-stop shop to access social science data, and this includes access to census data as part of our remit. So for the UK data service, you can access data from 1971 through to 2011. Um, we expect uh, the latest census data, the 2021 stuff for England, to be made available from 2020 beyond onwards, possibly for our applications. The Scottish stuff will obviously be different and later because they've not actually done the 22 census yet in Scotland. And within the UK data service, we have different applications to access different types of census data. So the main census data is a census aggregate data. Um, and those are like the grouped um, population stats. And then we have census micro data, which provides quite detailed information for smaller numbers of people. And census flow data, which provides um, data on migration. So that's people, how they travel to work on census day and also um, their last address before the census. So it gives you some information on how people have been moving around the country. And then we also have supporting data, such as census boundary data. And these are the geographic um, boundaries for the various census output geographies, which can be used to visualize the census data. And in this workshop today, we'll be using census boundary data in, a court, in association with the census stats to create some maps and other types of visualization. So today you'll get access, you'll be using both census aggregate data and census boundary data. 
So the purpose of this, this first exercise and this first part of the, uh, uh, the workshop is to visualize census data using choropleth maps. <clears throat> so if we have tables of census statistics, we can join or link them to census boundaries, like on the slide. So at the top left, we have a table of census statistics. And these show, this shows information from the census, in this case, for local authorities. So we have Edinburgh, Renfrewshire, and West Lothian. And each of these areas has a unique geographical identifier, which is a nine-digit code that uniquely identifies that, um, that record within the census data. And you can see we have information such as some males and uh, this, I think it's manufacturing, number of males uh, employed in manufacturing. And we can have the same geography in terms of the actual boundaries. And these, these um, describe that geography on the ground. So the extent of, say, Edinburgh or East and West Lothian. And by linking the census stats to the boundaries, we then have some way we can then describe the census stats as a map. So in this case, we can say that Edinburgh has been assigned the value of 5.27% of males are employed in manufacturing, whereas in West Lothian, 14.93% of males are employed in manufacturing. But it's not very interesting just like this, because we, have, we can only look at the different values to see where the, the, the different um, population stats are. It's far better if you can colorize those regions. And this is what our choropleth map does. It basically shades the polygons of the census areas according to the census variable that's been linked to those boundaries. So for example, high, high census stat values could have like high shades of green and, and low values have um, lighter shades. And that way, when you view the entire data set, you can quite easily see where the high areas of the particular stat are and the low areas are. And that gives you a great way of like getting some, a look into the actual data. So for example, this map shows the percentage of people employed in agriculture in forestry and fishery. And you can quite see, clearly see the difference in the urban and rural split. And also the difference in the Scottish Highlands and the Scottish borders in terms of the number of people employed in fishery and forestry. Now these are a type of chloropleth map called a univariate chloropleth map in which it only displays a single variable. You also get more complicated chloropleth maps which attempt to display two variables at once. And that can be quite interesting because it means you can, you can display multiple variables at the same time. So here we have the first chloropleth map, which is showing poor health from low to high, and a second chloropleth map, which is unemployment from low to high. And we can basically combine those together to create a, a map that shows the two variables together. So on the bivariate map, the, the very pale areas are where both unemployment and poor health is low, where the dark areas are where unemployment and health is high. So you can, it's, it's, a, it's a nice way of, instead of doing, showing two separate chloropleth maps, you can just show a single one. So when you're creating chloropleth maps, there's some quite, there's some specific guidance which can help you in this process. Um, so the, the thing is to choose the correct output census geography, you remember I said that the census variables are available at different levels of geography. You have to standardize your census variables. You have to choose an appropriate classification method and then choose the color ramp to tell you how to actually um, describe the data. So in choosing the output census geography, um, you have to make, you have to be, um, pick the, uh, what, what you think is most appropriate for your data. So for example, we could, we could display the same variable by local authority, by medium super output areas, or by output areas. And by mapping and analyzing the data at different levels, we can get different insights. So for example, patterns present at, um, so, so patterns present at one scale may not be different, may not be displayed at other scales, because at, at the larger areas, the, the data will tend to get um, smoothed. Whereas in the much more high resolution data, 
you might get a lot more noise. So the, the local authority is good for picking up general patterns, where the output area level is a lot more detailed and allows you to, to drill into detail in much finer detail. In terms of standardized data and census variables, by themselves, the census data gives you raw counts. So the number of people per output area or the number of people per county. And you can't just map it like that as it is, because the high counts will just simply show you where the people are. Instead, you've got to do some sort of standardization so that you can compare that, that area to another part of the country in a standard way. There are two ways you can do that. You can divide that, um, that, that, that count by the area of the actual area of the boundary, or more likely, you can just you can divide it by the total population size within that area. So instead of showing a raw count, you're showing a proportion. And instead of saying that in this census area there are 500 people, you're saying that in this census area, 15 percent of those people are employed in manufacturing, or are male, or are female, or travel to work by car or bicycle. And that because it's a standard measure, you can compare other areas. And then when we, when we construct a chloropleth map, we also need to perform classification. So our raw data might have values from three to 93, but because we can't, the way it is at the minute, we have like a unique values. What we need to do is like um, generalize the data into data classes so that we can like try and find the patterns within it. So we might have five classes here, say from three to 20, 21 to 38, 39 to 56, 57 to 74, or 75 plus. And what we do when we, when we apply classes is, is we decide how the data is assigned to each of these classes. And there are different classification methods available. Uh, some of which you'll see in the QGIS exercise which follows this talk. So for example, this quantile, equal interval, natural breaks, or manual. And the class, the, the determining which classification we choose will cause the data be, to be drawn in particular ways. Um, so for example, I have the same data set here, and depending on the number of classes I use to, to, to classify the data and the classification method I use, I can get various, I can get different sorts of maps being shown. And the point is that no classification, classification is, method is right or wrong. But the classification if you do choose should be based on the characteristics of the data to avoid constructing misleading maps. And then once you've done apply the classification, we then need to apply a color ramp, which, which basically tells you how the polygons are shaded. And different color ramps are applied to different sorts of data. So sequential would simply be going from a, a low value to a high value. And you can see there's a, a graduation from light to dark. Diverging would be data plus or minus around a central zero value. So that could be areas that are increasing in value versus decreasing value. Whereas qualitative would be non-numeric data. So this could be data that's showing like a, um, it could be land cover, or it could just be like, you could have an urban rural classification where some polygons are describing urban areas and some are rural areas. And then in that case, it wouldn't make sense to, uh, to describe it qual quantitatively. You would simply describe, have a different color, which is a categorical thing. So you'll get to practice all these creating chloropleth maps in the QGIS exercise that follows. But to show you what's going on, I will first run through the exercise live and then you'll have time to do it yourself. So, so this is the UK data service. And I say as part of this, we provide census data. And the part of the UK data service that we're going to obtain census data for in order to create a color graph map from is called Infuse. Um, and we're gonna, Infuse provides access both to 2011 census data and 2001 census data. And we're gonna grab data for 2011. So what you would do in the exercise that follows this is you would go to Infuse and click the 2011 census data 
box here. And when you're using Infuse, there are two means of like making your first selection of the data. You can either select by geography or by topics. And we're going to select by geography first. So. Infuse is doing a lot of work in the background, so there may be some delays as we run through the using the service. Okay, so because we selected we want to go by geography, we've got the various geographies that are available. Um, so I'm going to create a map for all of the UK, and then I'm going to obtain census data by a local authority. So for each of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, I'm going to select local authorities, like so. So I select those, and then I add them to my, I guess, my shopping basket almost. And then what Infuse has done is gone away and worked out what data is available at these geographies. And you can see there's like a load of different combinations of data here. And using these filters at the left, I can constrain the sort of data that I want to, I can constrain, I can limit what data I actually want. So in my case, and I can apply multiple filters. So let's see, I can constrain by sex. And then I can also constrain by let's have a look, industry. And you can see it's dropped the number of combinations down from about 80 just to a single topic combination. And if I select that topic combination, I get some information about what's available. So you can spend your time reading through this. And within that topic, I now have to select the actual variables. So I'm interested in creating a UK map of, I think, the percentage of males and females employed in manufacturing. So the variables I'm going to select are age 16 to 74. Um, I want total industry and manufacturing. I need total industry because I want to use that as a, when I'm doing my um, standardization of manufacturing so that I can show my manufacturing as a percentage of a total employment. And then I want both males and females. So, so you see, I grabbed four variables here. And so Infuse is ready. So at this point, I can click get to the data. And Infuse will go away and pull that data out for me. And let me just download it. So it comes as a zip file, which I can extract. And within the zip file, you basically get three um, individual files. You get citations, which I think just describe, provides copyright statements you have to use if you want to use the data. You get meta, which describes the actual variables and I guess the units they use. And the data itself is this CSV file called the data age equal intersex unit. And if I open this in LibreOffice, though if you're using Windows, you can use Excel. You can see what the data looks like that's come from Infuse. Before I use this in QGIS, I need to do some cleaning up and tidying up of the data. So the first thing I do, you can see Infuse has created this strange line here where there are like null entries. So I'm just going to get rid of this line. And then I've tied up some of the columns. And I'm just going to rename these columns here. So I just have to refer to my notes. So, so this column 
is the total number of males within this local authority. This column is the total number of females. And then these columns are the males or females employed in manufacturing. So I'll just rename them to something more um, memorable. Male, male manufacturing and female manufacturing. Oops. And what we want to do now, we want to create, we want to standardize our data. So rather than in our map queue, just, just showing this raw uh, male manufacturing value of 1912, you want to show that as a percentage of all males. So we have to do like a simple calculation in our spreadsheet here. So Wrong column. <laughs> That's more likely. Okay. And let me just give this a name. Um, okay. And we need a similar thing for the females. And then I can apply that to all the cells. And do likewise for female. Now I just save my data now. And I can check it, what it looks like in the actual CSV. And you can see that the numeric data looks fine. We have this problem with some of the, the geo code, which in our case is the geographic identifier. And you can see the way that Infuse has worked. It's inserted trailing spaces to the Northern Ireland geo IDs. So if we had try to use this in QGIS, it will create problems. So we have to go back into the data in Excel or LibreOffice and correct these. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply trim these Northern Ireland GUIDs to strip off that, that, that white space. I need to apply this to the first 27 rows. So I'll just copy that and paste it back into position over here.
Okay, sorry about that. I don't often use Excel for data analysis, so hopefully that's okay. Let me just check it in a WordPad. Yes, that looks correct. Great. So we grabbed data from Infuse and we've done some preparation on it. So it's now ready for us to be able to map in QGIS. So we've got the CSV data, the census data. We now need to get the actual boundaries that we're going to create our map from. And that's available from a different part of the UK data service called, um, we, um, let's look here. So UK data service. And if I scroll down to the bottom here, uh, in fact, find data, we want to browse and access data, I think. Yep. I have to scroll to the bottom here to find, ah, browse open census data. Yep. You want census boundary data. Um, this will take us to boundary data selector. What, what we actually want is easy download. So we want to grab some data that matches to infuse. So we go to this tab here and we want to grab some local authorities. This is all explained in the PDF you'll use in a bit. And you want to download the features in the shapefile format. So if I look at the downloaded data, And let me just open QGIS. So QGIS is a desktop GIS. Um, if you've never used the GIS before, it might seem overwhelming, but QGIS, it, it, um, the, the notes we've given you will try and help you use it. The first thing you have to do when you use QGIS is to, um, geographic data is provided in different um, reference systems because it has to describe different parts of the world. Um, by default, QGIS will default to showing data in lat long and using a global projection. Called, so we first have to change this to the, use the British National Grid, which all data within the UK data service is provided in. So this is explained your notes. So you basically You'll go to the bottom here, click this button, and pick British National Grid, and apply an OK. And you can see that it's changed from 4326 to 27700. And then we can now add that vector shape file, which we downloaded from the UK data service. So th this button here is called the data source manager. And this is the button you always use to add data to QGIS. It could be a shape file or a CSV file. So I'll open the data source manager. I've got different, you, the, at the left here are different types of data you can add. So I want to add vector data. So I click vector and I use the two arrows here to choose my data set. So it was that infused disk layer clipped. So I just open, add, and you can see these are the boundaries that have been added to QGIS from the UK data service. And we now to add our CSV file. So again, we use the data source manager. So back into that folder, select our data CSV. And you can see that QGIS has provided a preview of what that data looks like at the bottom here. And you can see it's got our, our, our new columns we created in Excel or LibreOffice. Mm. When you do this, you have to make sure that under geometry definition, it's set to no geometry. Because otherwise QGIS will try and create like a point and it won't find any coordinates. So that won't work properly. So we just add and then close. And we can open that data there. So you can see we've got the same data we had from Excel or LibreOffice in QGIS. 
And what we now have to do is join that data of, of sensor statistics to the sensor's boundaries. And we can do this by using a thing called join. So we would double click the layer, go to joins at left, and click we want to create a new join. So click the add green button. Because I've only got one CSV that um, file loaded, it's been added automatically to the top box here. If you had more than one, you'd have to pick which one to use. But because we only have one, we only have one choice. We now have to specify which field within the CSV file contains the geographic identifier, and which field within the boundaries contains the geographic identifier, which QGIS will use to relate the two tables. So in the case of us, in the, set, it's the geocode in the CSV data, and again, the geocode in the boundaries. So we apply that. And now, if I open the attribute table of the shape file, you can see that our data from the census stats has been joined to the boundaries. And in fact, I can click on any of the polygons and I can see the proportion of males or females within that area. And so what we now need to do is create a crawl depth map using our now center stats joined to the boundaries. And to do this, double click, from left choose symbology, or from top pick graduated, and we now have to show, we have to pick which variable we want to display as our crawl depth map. So let's say I want to show the proportion of males employed in manufacturing. And then we click the classify button. And like I was saying in the presentation, we have to, we have to pick the classification we, have to, we want to use. So I might go for natural break jenks. I mean, as I said in the slides, you also have to decide what color ramp to apply. So I'm going to show them in green from low to high value and click the apply button. And we have a chlorophyll map of our data. So, so low values of green or white or where there's low proportion of the male population employed in manufacturing. Dark areas are where it's a lot higher. So you can pick out um, around the areas of Newport and Wales, which is like the steel mills, um, the north of England, sort of manufacturing. And you'll see a lot lower in London, where there's people that tend to be more employed in service sectors. I'm within QGIS. There's loads of other stuff you can do. In the document, you can actually create a print map layout, which the PDF will describe. So I'm going to stop demoing QGIS for now and hand over to you for you to go through the workbook for, until 3 o'clock, when I then will talk again about using cartograms. I've now got another short presentation that I'm going to talk about creating cartograms and flow maps. And after this, there'll be a further QGIS exercise where you'll be able to create a cartogram. So other than chlorophyll maps, <coughs> two other forms of geographical visualization commonly made using sensor data are cartograms and flow maps. So a cartogram is a special form of map projection where the polygons are area are drawn in proportion to the variable being mapped rather than the land area of the polygon. So you can see on the top here, we've got three different types of cartogram. If a non-contiguous cartogram, a contiguous cartogram on a darling cartogram, and you can see that the, the boundaries have been distorted according to an actual variable rather than being just being based on the geographic extent. I mean, cartograms are great for like, excuse me, I'm just going to have to, uh, cartograms are great because they means if you have a chlorophyll map of Scotland, you could have data shown for Glasgow and Edinburgh, which occupy quite small areas, and they tend to get lost within the bigger lot of urban, uh, the, the country areas. They tend to get hidden, and you might draw false conclusions from the map, but 
using our cartogram, we would distort the polygons based on the variable. <coughs> Excuse me. You get a, a you can see different patterns, which be, is really quite interesting, and there's sort of different types of cartogram. And cartograms feature quite um, extensively in the wild, so to speak. Um, they were shown quite a lot in the Guardian as part of their Brexit reporting. Um, so you get a cartogram like this, and you can see that although Scotland occupies quite a large geographic area, um, the actual number of people living there is quite small. Um, whereas London occupies a relatively sorry, yeah. So London has a lot more people living there than a much smaller area. So when you distort the polygons by the population, they tend to swell up. And cartograms, there's an entire book written by Danny Darling, who's like a prominent census person, which entirely uses cartograms rather than chloropleth maps to depict um, census data. It's a really cool book. There's like each chapter goes through a different sort of type of census data. Um, and it's full of these wonderful cartograms. In the QGIS exercise that follows this, you'll have the opportunity to create your own um, cartogram. So, yeah. What you'll be creating in the QGIS exercise is a contiguous cartogram of this sort, like on the right here, where you distort the boundaries and you'll basically, just, yeah, the you'll distort the polygons according to some variable, which is quite cool. So another type of census data is census flow data. Um, and what census flow data is based on a question on the census form, which asks people for the address of their place of work. Um, so what you end up with is a data like this or table here. So down the left-hand side, you have, what well, have we got? One, two, three, four, seven different um, regions. And along the top, you have the same seven. And it basically depicts the migration flow between each of the polygons, the, the regions, sorry. So between, say, Northumberland and County Durham, Northumberland and Newcastle and Tyne, Northumberland and Gateshead. Um, and this is quite useful for planning purposes. Um, and this data is available through the wicked part of um, the UK data service. And the sort of visualizations you can create from that data tend to be these, these flow maps. So it, what I've got is an example on the left here of the UK. And this is showing the migration. I think it's, it's not the migration, it's the place of work. Um, between Edinburgh and the rest of the UK. This was probably pre-pandemic. So you can see there's large flows from like Edinburgh down to London, which is probably the people who tend to like commute from Edinburgh to London on a sort of Monday and Friday to work in the city of London. And they go back to Edinburgh at the end of the week. Um, it's the simple sort of diagram here you can create in QGIS. Um, people have created more WYSI sort of um, type flow maps using sort of quick cool styling and stuff. An alternative is, is to not show the boundaries at all and create these things called core diagrams, which basically just like, they map um, from an origin to a destination. Um, I think this is like for the US. So it's showing the flow from say New York to California. And the, the width of the actual, what they call chords, it depicts how much flow there actually is. And that's like an interesting way of showing flow data without using a, a map. In some ways, it can be more powerful. So we have a, an exercise now in QGIS where you'll create a cartogram. Um, and again, I'll do a first run through the exercise on my own machine. And then we'll give you 20 minutes to do it yourself. So let me just, again, do some screen swapping. <laughs> So bear with me again. <laughs> and for this exercise, we're not going to download data from the web. 
we're going to use data that's been prepared beforehand and that is available in the zip file which you've been sent a link to and which will provide a link to afterwards so just bear with me i've already downloaded that de that document is a zip file into my desktop so if you've downloaded that data you'll see the contents you've got the workbooks and this census training data folder within that census training data folder are four different subfolders um, the cartogram corpus and tableau we'll be using the tableau one later on as well so for now the cartogram one contains census data for leads at the middle super upper air level and it contains a shape file plus a csv file so like we did in the chloropref exercise we will open the shape file in qgis and then we'll add the csv file and join the two together and then we'll create some visualizations so let me just open qgis first again so qgis is open just check Again, we have to set the projection to British National Grid. And same drill as before, use the data connector to add the shapefile. This time from the pre-downloaded data. So here we've got middle layer super output areas for our leads. And just add the CSV file again from the pre downloaded data. Checking we've got no ge geometry defined. And again, same drill as before, we have to join the data. So this is all explained in the workbook. So I can just check the attribute table and you can see we've joined the sets of stats to the boundaries. This data actually shows its tenure for by household. So it basically displays what people are, are privately renting, which people have mortgages or which people are renting from local authorities and stuff. And we can do what we did before and create a chloroprof map to start with. So, so I want to show the percentage by private renting. I'm just going with my natural breaks again and green. And you see the problem, we've got like our small polygons in the city center, so it's, which tend to get mixed by the outer polygons. We want to actually create a cartogram QGIS by default doesn't include the cartogram functionality, but you can use a plugin to do it for us. A plugin is just a piece of software that you add to QGIS to do add extra functionality. So we have to install it first. And when it installs it, it adds a new button to the QGIS toolbar. So it's literally just a case of picking that later. And then we pick the variable we want to create the, the cartogram from. And it will go away and build the cartogram. And then, so there's our cartogram. And there's our chlorophyll map. And you can compare. Some people don't like cartograms because they think it distorts geography too much. And you can't tell what's what. But I think they're a good way of alternative way of viewing the data. <clears throat> so I'll stop sharing now and you've got 20 minutes to work through the cartogram PDF and try and create a cartogram. And again, any problems, put something in the question and answer and we'll try and help you out. I'll just show you the other screen so I can the links to the data the workbooks. So basically, if you download that zip file we sent you earlier, you should have that folder with a workbook PDF and that data folder for the lead data. So it's just a case of working through that workbook and you should end up creating a cartogram 
The workbook is also available via this link. And as I said, at 3.30, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So at 3.45, I'll start talking again and we'll move on to using Tableau or having QGIS. So again, any questions, just pop them in the chat. Hello, everyone. So hopefully you managed to create a cartogram. We're now going to start looking at um, Tableau. So this session is a bit different. There's no actual slides as such. We get it's a practical hands-on exercise. Just get to dive straight into using Tableau because we have limited time. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what's going to happen in the exercise, and then I'll give you time to go away and do it. And again, stick your questions and answers in the box. So let me just do a screen shuffle again. I think what Tableau is, it only runs on Windows and Macs. It doesn't actually run on Linux, which I'm using. So I'm going to have to run Tableau inside of a virtual machine in Windows on my Linux box. So this is why you have this slightly strange setup here, but I'll continue. So the exercise actually has two parts to it. There's a first part where you basically map some global, um, some global data by country. And there's a second part where you map some census data. Um, and what we're going to do, I suggest, is we just do the second part using the census data. So let me just try and remember how to do this process. Right. Okay. So first of all, and we're going to use data inside that census training data folder as a table subfolder, which contains all the data you need. So you won't need to do any more downloads. So let me just fire up Tableau. Um, you see, Tableau is a lot um, more slick than Securgis. Um, it's quite a nice piece of software. And what I want to do, we're going to be using two files. We're going to be using this travelgm.csv file, which you might just open in something. Um, notepad and you can see this is data about travel to work by some geography which is wards so we've got a shape file for that so let me just extract that and these are wards for 2011 so a bit like in QGIS we first have to add the CSV data to Tableau and then the shape file to Tableau, and then do a bit of joining to create, stick put them together, and then do some manipulation of the data, and then create some sort of graphics and visualizations using Tableau. So let me have a look. So the first thing I'm going to do is connect to the CSV file. So this is this travelgm.csv. And Tableau will read the data. Um, you can get rid of this thing on the side here. So this is our data in Tableau. And if we create this data interpreter thing here, Tableau will try and do some cleaning on the data. And what we want to do is grab all this data here. And we want to basically pivot the data. Does that work? Um, Let me start again. Okay. Okay. Right. Let's try that again. The instructions are really clear. So if you follow them, which I wasn't doing, you should be okay. Right. 
so the dates have been pivoted. So this means instead of like say 30 rows with five columns, we've now got 150 rows with a single column. So which is just a different way of representing the data, but it's, we need to do that for the table to create visualization from it. And we might want to, it's quite good in Tableau where you can, you can rename the columns. So I'm just, this is actually Ward. And this is local authority. And this is travel to work method. This is a percentage of people using that travel work method. Okay, so we've done some work on the data, on the CSV data rather. And we now want to add the boundaries. So in the same way, we do an add and connect to a spatial file, which will be our shape file. And you can see that we've got these connections to the CSV and the shape file. And we've also got the file here. And we now need to relate the CSV to the shape file. So the first way to do this is to double click. This is called the table canvas. So we double click the CSV file on the canvas, it creates this, and then we can try and connect the shape file. So I drag it across here. And you can see that Tableau has been quite clever and it's trying to create a join by itself without us having to tell it, but it doesn't know how to join the data. So like in QGIS, you have to specify which fields to use to do the join. So it's geocode in the CSV file and geocode one in the shape file. And you can see it's made a join because to our CSV file in Tableau, we have our attributes and we have a geometry column from that shape file. And now we can actually, having prepped the data in Tableau, we can now do the actual interesting stuff and create visualizations from it. So Tableau has different types of, um, there's different parts to Tableau. There's the preparation bit here. We can create worksheets, which are like where you build graphics and plots and stuff. There are dashboards where you can create like visualizations for consumption by end users. This can contain multiple worksheets. So you could have a dashboard showing a map or a graphic, and then you could like publish that to Tableau Public Online, and then someone could view your visualization on a website. And there's this thing called Tableau Stories, where you can basically create 10 different steps or so, and allow users to page through different visualizations to tell a story about your data, which can be quite nice. But you basically start with worksheets, you build your visualization on worksheets, and then you can add them to dashboards and stories. So we want to create our first worksheet. And Tableau is all drag and drop. You basically have your tables, your data, and this is your, your work area, and you usually drag stuff across to it in order to create your visualizations. So the first thing we want to do is just create a table of our data. So I'm going to drag the travel work method across. And And we want local authority and wards. So it's, it's, we've got the outline of the table. We don't actually have the values yet because we have to tell Tableau how to display them. So we want to display by percentage of people. So we have to drag this across here.
No, that's not worth it. Yeah, okay, you have to double click rather than dragging. So important tip there, double click, don't drag. So now we have a table which shows the data from our CSV by ward and then local authority. And table, and we want to now create a bar chart. So that's another type of sheet. Drag percentage of people, columns. Yep. And travel to work method to what I do. Yeah, so we're now we're symbolizing the data broken down as bar charts by travel work method. So you can see for Harper Green, for example, the travel work method by not unemployment. Okay. Yeah, driving a car or van is 35%. And then you get the different breakdowns. So that's non-geographic. We can, because we've got the boundaries, we can create a map. So again, we create another sheet. And we can add the geometry by double clicking. And you can see we've got our census boundaries within Tableau. And the minute we mouse over, we just see the, we don't, we're, not, we're not able to click on the individual areas. But we can correct this by grabbing ward. And now we get the individual areas, but there's still some strange things going on because we've got like multiple things showing for particular regions, which we can correct. So we can grab local authority as well. So it disaggregates by local authority as well. I think the problem before was you could have the awards with the same name in multiple local authorities. So when it's grouping, it's not showing the individual ones. And then we can create a dashboard from our two plots, from our bar chart and our map by clicking the new dashboard button. So you can, if you hover over here, you can see the types of things you created. So we've created a map. So we can drag that across, create a bar chart. And what's nice about Tableau is you can use one visualization to filter the other. So you can use this as a filter and select Astley Bridge, and it will then zoom to the boundary. And we can see the stat for the boundaries, or we can do the opposite. We can use the map as a filter for the bar chart. So, and then we can zoom into one of the polygons, like down here, and it will show the bar chart just for that polygon. So this is the exercise that you will now do. Uh, and I suggest you start with the second step. But I say, if you get through that and you've got time left, then you can do the first one as well. It's a different exercise, it's different data. So you're not gonna cause any problems. So let me just swap my screen again. If you download the census data pack, there's a Tableau intro workbook in it. And again, your data is within that folder. You'll have a census training data folder and a Tableau subfolder with all the data you need. So just work for the PDF and any questions in the chat again, and we'll try and help you. And then at six at 4.45, we'll bring the data a close with just some quick demos of stuff and any outstanding questions. 
So chloroflip maps are not without problems um, because they tend to apply the population distributed uniformly across the extent of the polygon, the sensor zone. And you can see here, for example, so we've got a bunch of polygons. And then what I've done is I've overlaid on top of a piece of an aerial photograph. And you can see that the actual, um, within the actual real world, you have areas of residential here. And then over here, you have like areas of parkland and sports facilities where there's no actual people. Whereas if you were creating a chlorophyll map and shaded it all red, then that would imply that there's people right across the entire zone, which does not actually reflect reality. So there's been a trend in recent years for people when creating sort of type maps from census data is to create, use an alternative approach called datametric mapping, which is this sort of idea where you have the, the polygons and then you have like a mask layer, which contains residential areas. And then what you do is you mask the polygons by the mask layer and you create a different form of mapping. And one of the websites that does this is I think of Datashine, which is created by a bunch of folk down in UCL. Um, and this is an alternative way of viewing census data. Um, and you can go to the Datashine website and you can browse through all the various census variables and view them using, so let me just show you Datashine. So if you've not seen it before, this is what Datashine looks like. And you can see what they've done is they've, they've taken all the boundaries and then clipped that data based on buildings. So you get a much more better representation of where the people live and stuff. And it's a really nice website. You can just browse through all the various types of census variable and see the various um, data that's available. So you could look at our travel for work map, for example, and in London, you could see travel work by bicycle. So that's a, a nice thing to look at. Um, there's also a set, because the census is delivered separately in England, it is from Scotland, the data is slightly different. So the data shine folk have a separate data shine Scotland website, which uses the same approach, but applied to Scottish data. We can share those links afterwards if you've not seen this stuff before. Um, just get rid of this. And also there's a really nice thing that ONS have produced called their Effective Maps Guide. Let me just try and find it. They published this back in 2018 and it's like a seven page document and it just walks you through, I think these are designed for publishing official census, like statistics, but it's got some really nice, great practice, best practice rather, and it's quite digestible. You can just walk through it. So it tells you about chloroplift maps, and it tells you about sort of how many categories you could choose and what's quite classification methods to use and stuff. It's got a bit about dot maps. It's also got stuff about cartograms as well, and it gives you advice on when cartograms are best to be used and stuff. So. It's a really nice thing to look at. And like I say, it's only seven pages, so it's really digestible. We can maybe look at sharing those as well. So that, that's really all I have to say for today. Um,